well, woken up, const. Is it const, right? Is that a good way to, to say it? Yeah, that's it, const, like the, the variable, you know? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I wanted to be sure there. But um, people will start funneling in uh, here, so maybe we give it a couple more minutes. But uh, really happy you came by. Happy to be here. I heard you guys just had a community call. Is that right? How'd it go? Uh, yeah, we had a community call. Um, we were just talking about some of the, the parameter changes that are coming in. You know, every every uh, every two weeks we, we do a call, talk about what's happened over the last uh, little while and discuss and then and then take some questions uh, from the community. And generally, they're pretty pointed and, and well-knowledgeable questions because people are using the software and being like, why doesn't this work? Um, and uh, opportunity to yell at us. So it went well, though. <laughs> that was good man and that's one of the things about web3 and i feel like is you know community is super involved and sometimes that comes uh with a with a whole entire you know headache of its own i guess you could say but i think it's also you know part of the decentralization thing right it goes it goes two ways definitely i mean you haven't you're you're part of a nation state um and you have people in your community who didn't even know you needed in your community and then they're there uh, solving problems for you um, and filling in the holes. I think that if you, if you run a, a traditional company, you just don't have that visibility uh, because people are not incentivized to do any work for you whatsoever. So um, you're like, Oh, wow. Uh, look, we have a whole marketing department that just, just popped up um, over here and they're incentivized to do guerrilla marketing for you. And in a really fantastic way. It's not something that I would know how to implement myself unless I hired, you know, an expensive marketing team. Um, so, so I think like, that's one of the, the beautiful things about just sharing ownership with people. Um, it really allows them to express their, their value into a community and a normal company doesn't have that. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I, I think Jay could also speak to this too with, uh, you know, we have a, kind of like a, you know, a decentralized news media thing that we're trying to help build up and, and WAG media and really uses the Kusama token, right. To incentivize people to create content and to find like information out there. Um, and I agree with you hundred percent, like people will take ownership of, you know, their own work and really just come up with some pretty incredible things and, and just take off. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, I, I know that you guys want to talk about um, chat GPT at some point today. Uh, I've been reading their research for a little bit. Uh, so we knew it was coming along. We didn't know it was going to be as good as it, as it eventually was. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, at some point. But they they had to do a, a, a lot of labeling in order to get their data set up to, up to, up to speed. Um, and because we're playing with incentives and where we have a nation state behind us as a project... Um, we don't even really need to go to, um, um, you know, for instance, like the Mechanical Turk. And we can build those kind of tools right into our community and, and hopefully leverage, uh, you know, the, the power of the crowd. I mean, that's, and that's part of our intention um, when we want to um, hit that benchmark as well. Awesome. Um, well, you know, I think that we got a decent crowd kind of uh, building up here. And as we go, I'm sure more will come in. So we'll just go ahead and get started if you don't mind, man. Let's do it. Um, so, yeah, everybody here and everybody going to be listening afterwards. This is Simon Knights. Uh, you know, I'm C. Saint here with the Kusumari. And we got Jay up here, too. And a lot of our regulars welcome everybody. <laughs> Love it. Love the sound effects. Uh, I do want to make sure to, you know, let everybody know that this is completely open space, meaning, uh, you know, I will have questions, of course, that I've prepared, but um, especially anybody from the Batensor community, um, anybody in the crowd that has any questions or wants to just jump in the conversation, feel free to request up. We'll get you up here and, and get going. Um, so to start us off, uh, we got Const up here, one of the co-founders of Batensor. Um, and an active developer as well. Uh, he made, wanted to make sure we highlighted that. He's definitely a big part of the community still, uh, you know, still working at it. So I just want to start with uh, Constant. You can tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of, you know, your role with BitTensor and how you guys came up with the idea. BitTensor, you know, uh, my girlfriend says uh, BitTensor. Uh, it's a bit of a hard one to say, but I think have a at least – a mild understanding of artificial intelligence or if you've been in the crypto community for 
more than one year, you know that it's bit tensor, right? Instead of bit tensor. Um, and uh, I I have my my roots in in both fields, so um, it was definitely something that that was an obvious connection in my mind um, when I was. I mean, I, I'm a trained machine, um, but I was also very much attracted to the power of decentralization and specifically things like Bitcoin um, through my university degree. And then, you know, after my university degree, I, I got very fascinated politically and, and, and also, you know, technologically in, in Bitcoin. Um, but it was interested in it for, you know, reasons aside from merely the political, what, what I saw with, with uh, Bitcoin, what technology that had created the largest supercomputer in the world um, as you know, at the same time, building a censorship resistant technology <clears throat> that allowed us to, you know, have freedom, money and all those things that are very important and underlie the, the, <clears throat> the amount of power that computation, um, that is, so which underlies what they're using that computation for. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of people that are also interested in that, uh, that question. So it, Bitcoin gets so large and, you know, they were talking about it at neural IPS. I was just at neural IPS, uh, last week. Um, and we were, we were part of the decentralized <clears throat> AI workshop. There it was very interesting. And there's a lot of researchers that are, you know, have, have been, and, and are looking at, um, peer to peer technology as this way for soaking up all of this computation, which is latent and unused, um, or is, <clears throat> is being incentivized into existence that's really what Bitcoin is doing on the flip side. And, and so I wanted to take that and, and turn it towards uh, doing artificial intelligence. So, so that's where, you know, I came into, to BitTensor and, and found this project and, and wanted to be a part of it and wanted to build it. And, and, you know, I've been at it for, for many years now. Um, the, the question is always, how are you going to do that? Right. Uh, how, how can you leverage the, way that Bitcoin leverages computation, but to do artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, our thinking is that, uh, number one, you need to figure out a, a technique for machine learning that is d distributed or decentralized. So what is a decentralized technique in, in machine learning and how can you then um, map that onto a peer-to-peer -peer network? So we, we, we use a mixture model style approach uh, where the model itself is sparse and split up and then we can stitch it together um, uh, from and and build uh, models on top of it so that's a mixture model and <clears throat> that's the approach we went with um sort of joining together sparse networks into larger ones which are better than the sum of the parts and that's a little bit like the sparsity of the human mind so anyway so that's that's one you know a uh, tool in our toolkit <clears throat> the the second i think more important one is how do you validate machine intelligence how do you creating it and who's not creating or who's doing work and who's not doing work. And in, in the case of Bitcoin, it's very easy to do that, right? Because the evaluating whether or not a hash is um, properly hashed or not uh, is this like all of one operation, right? You look at it and you say, okay, great. Uh, in Bitcoin's uh, in book, in Bitcoin's case, you, you actually just need to count the zeros at the beginning of the hash. Um, with machine intelligence, uh, it's much more fuzzy. It's much more difficult to discern, uh, separate the the non-intelligent from the intelligent, and but you can still do it. And you know, when I was working at at Google um, and and also studying machine learning before that, you know, we learn various techniques for determining, um, you know, what is useful and what is not useful, and that's that's the study of salience methods. They're called. Um, it's the methods where you can determine whether or not, for instance, a neuron within is useful. Um, and if it is useful, then you, you don't want to prune it. You don't want to change it. Um, and the inverse. And so we, we basically combine those, those technologies together with blockchains to build incentive mechanisms uh, for distributed, decentralized, highly sparse neural networks. Um, and, and then Bob's your uncle. That's what BitTensor is. That's what we've been doing for the last you know, two years um, coming up on the, the set and 
yeah, it's been growing like crazy and, and really exciting to see how this technology is exploding and the people in this chat are, are you know, making it a reality with us. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, um, the way you describe that is uh, a really good picture. I think using the human mind is, is a, a great way to think about it. And you talk about like, you know, pruning those neurons and pruning those models that are useful versus non-useful. When you say models, are these like individual nodes? Are these like people who are deploying their models from their like, you know, personal, uh, whatever they've developed themselves? Maybe if you could expand on that a little bit. It can be, it can really be anything. Um, in practice, people just host the, the best model that they can, right? Um, that's the most efficient market strategy for, for BitTensor right now um, that I think people have discovered, and there's even some miners in this call that I'm sure you can bring up to the uh, to the stage here, and they'll tell you better than me. Uh, but really, these endpoints that we're stitching together are just functions; they're generalizable functions. They don't need to be uh, whole machine learning models capable of doing um, everything, and and they just need to be able to do this translation from from inputs to outputs. Uh, we call them neurons through like a biological analogy. Um, they could be a single layer. They could be an individual behind a keyboard. They could be uh, your, I mean, obviously none of those things would work. Um, and, and in practice, you need computation, like heavy computation behind these endpoints that can do, do the inference in, like to actually run the, the function, no matter what it is. Um, so, so in practice, they, they are machine learning models and they're hosted on, um, I would say enterprise level software most of the time, uh, v VPSs, uh, people's home computers, and capable of taking textual inputs in BitTensor's current imp um, implementation, current iteration. We're just working on text, but they're able to take uh, textual impl um, text text inputs and produce outputs uh, at two in two ways, really. And the first way is by producing just raw representations, which is just a set of numbers that represent the text, and then also um, uh, logits, which are the predictions um, for the sentence, which allows you to do things like generations. So it's just kind of like tensor type outputs that are slightly different. Um, and that's where the, the name comes from, bit tensor, uh, being that w the, the output of these, in, these models are, um, the output of these endpoints is tensors, and we can use those tensors uh, to do all sorts of things. We can build applications on top of them. We can train from those outputs. And I'm sure I can get to more of that later if you have the question. Yeah, I think that kind of leads us into, um, maybe if we can parallel this a little bit. For the people that, you know, um, may not have the exact background, um, you know, of artificial intelligence and having a familiarity familiarity with it, um, if we could parallel it maybe to, you know, open AI and this chat, G chat GPT, which yeah. everybody's, you know, pretty enamored with, you know, how do you parallel the tensor yeah. versus open AI and apps versus chat B GPT right. and such? Right. It's amazing what they've done. And it, they've really, really giants to, to build this application. They, they've reached into, I would say like kind of unpopular um, artificial intelligence domains, number one being supervised um, learning and also reinforcement learning and use both of them in conjunction with unsupervised learning. And I'll explain what those mean in a second uh, to build this really, really interesting uh, technology, this really, really interesting application. So they've like pulled together all sorts of different types of machine learning to build this amazing tool. Um, now, so all of the things that they built though, the chat GPT, for instance, um, there, this application are rest on top of, language models that are pre-trained so they they what they did is they took their gpt line of models and they fine-tuned them to examples which are uh, which have been generated from from uh, a set of like 40 or so in uh, labeling and answering prompts so if you if you use the gpt3 model just by itself and you ask it to say generate you know okay you type in a sentence and it'll try to complete it it will try to like uh, you say the cat went to the park. It will then say, and it, you know, walked past the dog and it was chased, right? Because that's the natural completion of the sentence, but it's not what you need for an actual chatbot, right? So, so what they did is they took that, that, that model 
be able to complete sentences um, as if they were naturally uh, occurring and and then fine tune that. So then took some labeled data sets uh, and, and they generated those labeled data sets from individuals and use those prompts to basically train it even further to specifically solve uh, the the task of being a chatbot. And so may, they made it useful with the supervised data set. So how does this connect to is working on just that initial stage? Let's, okay, can we, can we complete the sentence? Can we complete the sentence? That's the self, um, uh, self-supervised or semi-supervised problem of understanding um, language. In a, and it's usually called representational learning or, 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 or pre-training. And uh, we work on that because as I mean, uh, chat GPT is a good example of a technology that's built on top of that. Right. So they, they, the educational power to train these really intense uh, GPT models. And then they take, took this fairly bespoke, uh, interesting, uh, uh, you could say like uh, machine learning technique, supervised plus reinforcement learning to fine tune it, to, to turn it into something that was really useful and amazing for people. So, uh, to get back to the, you know the question, which was like, so how does BitTensor fit into this? Like, we're we're focusing on that that unsupervised label um, layer, and making sure that that we can match the GPT three styling, and at the same time, we're we're designing and and, and dreaming about what we can do to perhaps even build something like a, a BitTensor, you know, a chat BitTensor on top of our le- level, on top of our foundation. Um, so that we can, you know, have that in our Discord and or build an application f- to to showcase the, the technology to other people and get people interested in what we're doing. Um, I got a question here. So, when you introduce blockchain into this equation here, what is that unlocking? And also, what kind of obstacles does that present? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to like the Chat GTP GPT thing, um, it doesn't seem like you're using blockchain at all, right? So, what's going on there? Right. I think. I think like the best way to understand what we're doing with blockchain is that blockchains allow us to um, open up closed systems, uh, bordered systems. So a company, it's a, it's a company which you have to apply to and is controlled by an HR department. And, you know, as I mentioned, the beginning of the call um, there, they have to pre think about what they need and it doesn't just get solved by them um, because there's a whole bunch of people that are inside their community, just solving problems for them. Um, When you use a blockchain, when you use a a permissionless system, when you use an open system that's governed by incentive, uh, you attract solve problems for you in really efficient ways. And you attract in our case, computational power that is, maybe not accessible to to us um, if we didn't do it in a really efficient way, right? There's all these Ethereum miners out there which have GPUs. Now, people have heard this point many times. Like it's, I think it's well uh, well talked about that that you can, if you can attract the Ethereum miners and your, those GPU resources, you'll be able to get a lot of compute. And that's that's definitely true. That's a, what we're we're using the incentive for is to is to stitch together a whole bunch of resources into a supercomputer, which is going to be on par with and maybe even exceeds what a, a company like OpenAI has at their disposal. I mean, that's a billion dollar problem because they they have a billion dollars from from Microsoft, and a lot of our competitors have hundreds of millions of dollars of, of funding. But our our claim really is that. Uh, we can get bigger if we, we stitch even more together, right? If we build op- open protocols, Bitcoin being a good example, we can get really, really big. And then I'd say on top of that, um, if you use markets, and I'm really, uh, you know, firm, you know, strong believer in, in the power of market dynamics to help with certain things. And one of those is, is to get people to produce a, a commodities cheaper, um, and, you know, what we're doing is representing this thing that we really need. We really need representational knowledge. We really, really need computers which can solve these, these micro problems together. So, so if we build that into a market, we can leverage the innovation of this open, decentralized, you know, borderless worldwide community to, to do it even better than a, a, maybe a centralized bureaucratic one can do. Now, that, that's that's. I'd say the core value proposition of, of, you know, these open systems. Now then there's a, a plethora of, of ethical ones as well. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a crypto anarchist that 
I, I really believe that that if we can build open systems, um, then we can distribute ownership and 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 govern them transparently, and and that'll be really really good for us to control something that's as powerful as artificial intelligence in the future. Now, right now we don't have the best in the world that that's open AI, um, but I think if we can if we can compete with them, it'd be really good for for everyone involved. Yeah, and that was one of my um, huge questions once we got into open AI was, you know, a lot, a lot of these, it's not like AI is brand new, right? You know, AI has been around for a while. <clears throat> and, you know, when I was doing some research on the video that we did for you guys, um, you know, Google's search engine itself is, uh, you know, AI baked in through and through, right? And mm-hmm. it's controlled by Google. They leverage it for their own, you know, gain. And yeah. they even monetize that in certain ways. And so I guess the other thought there is, you know, open AI, even though they're not maybe doing that right this moment, um, you know, that can also be, it, it's controlled by a central entity and can be guided and the weights can be changed, the input and, you know, so on and so forth can be changed by them and censored by them. I wonder what yeah, your absolutely. thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. That's like a new domain of censorship potential where you have all these, tools that people are using in schools and across the world and to get information and and that's um being patched by an organization which is um you know behest to its point or you know one point or another it's it's it really it answers to them and not and not you know um the crowd and and i think that that's the one of these the beautiful things about about uh web three systems is is our ability to you know with proof of work um push pull in i would say pull in people that would formerly have no ability to get on the board of directors right and here they are effectively being the board of directors of this decentralized project and and i think that's a really good thing it's a different power base it's a different it's like a democratic power base now so the censorship thing is a, is a big one, right? I really can see in the future, you know, a lot of people using this technology, OpenAI's chatbot, and, and, and you say, hey, like, what do you think about this? And they're like, well, you know, according to experts, you know, X, Y, Z, maybe that's a good thing. I, I, I think that there's definitely um, good reason to have, you know, a hierarchy or an ivory tower with knowledge, but it shouldn't be the only um viewpoint in the world and and i think that as ai becomes more and more integrated into our lives we, we should just be really careful about who controls it and and we should also have alternatives we should let the free market really choose and and there should be it shouldn't be a monopoly on on control of that and so we built it so that the people that actually hold a, a certain amount of tau can they could very easily leverage BitTensor to create their own version of these technologies um because they're holding tau so we'll have multiple chatbots built by multiple people that you can use if you want to. And, and that's, that's the way that Twitter should have been built, in my opinion, a long time ago. So, so that's, that's one. Um, I think another thing is like about uh, the, the revenue stream and, and um, the sense to look at the technology like G, uh, ChatGPT and go, holy fuck, my, my job is at risk here. Like, oh my God, this thing is this thing is like scary good. This thing is going to replace me. Uh, you know, I better get a, I better get a chunk of this. Like I better latch on somehow. I better, I better tether myself to this technology in some way that I'm not forgotten. Right. Um, either by working on it um, um, or owning it. Or, and we provide all of those avenues to people. Right? You can, if, if that's the case and we're going to build it, you know, in BitTensor, you can, own it you can validate it you can control it that way um you can actually control the hardware that it runs on you can you can really really get yourself integrated into this technology to make sure that you're you're not left behind so to speak um that's more sci-fi but i think it's 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 a it's reasonable argument keep at it oh yeah I've, i've seen already you know um, that there's been tweets out there, right? Like if you're not using chat GPT already, you're behind, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. and it maybe, maybe that's a little bit aggressive right now, but I could definitely see it start to infiltrate the way that people work, right? Cause it, it is such a big, um, you know, augmenter of workflow. And like you said, can possibly replace a lot of, um, 
you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people's jobs. Um, but, uh, Dr. M, you know, I see you up here, welcome up. And I saw you in the chat down below said, uh, you know, but tensors change your life. I wonder if you wanted to expand on that a little bit. <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you for um, allowing the discussion um, about BitTensor. Um, absolutely. Yes. In, in so many different ways, you know, not uh, not just in one way. I feel um, it's uh, been that way uh, intellectually, um, uh, materially in, and also just in terms of um, the general outlook of the future. Um, so uh, you yeah, just wanted to say a couple of things, uh, and I'm far from the only one. Um, you know, I, in fact, I'm very uh, relatively new. Uh, there are a couple of months um, uh, into uh, mining BitTensor, which is the process of serving um, AI models at a node. Um, and, you know, it, uh, every time I talk about BitTensor, I get uh, way too excited. Um, but it's really because it's tackling, a, a, you know, probably one of the most core problems of AI. And that's that this is um, uh, more powerful than um, many of the tools that humanity has ever had before. And it's just simply unreasonable to expect that um, when in the hands um, or control of a few, that that will go in the best interest of uh, the many. And so um, this is, uh, you know, a, a, um, a software protocol that really tackles this in a way that works uh, for the first time. And so I just find that uh, really ground groundbreaking. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just leave it there for the moment. But, uh, but really, you know, what I, I find myself um, not really being able to talk about AI anymore other than to talk about BitTensor because I just find that... Um, Frankly, nothing in this space um, is quite as um, uh, groundbreaking as what BitTensor is doing. And I think that um, uh, the world is kind of, for the most part, just doesn't know yet. Um, and uh, I look forward to, um, to the future. And there is very real value building here, you know. So we all know that AI takes um, training uh, to um, get better, to, to get more intelligent, and that um, that training is resource intensive. We also, you know, it's already well demonstrated and, and you know, how that's um, a very useful thing to do. Uh, on BitTensor, um, I, as a person who is not hired as an ML engineer at a relatively high caliber position in a company like Google, have a chance to do this. And um, that's extraordinary. Um, nowhere else would that be possible. Amazing, amazing take. That's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I have no background in uh, AI or, but when I was reading about Bit BitTensor, uh, you know, I, I myself was getting pretty excited about it. It's a really great, uh, incredible idea that's, that's working today. Um, and GP, I see your hand up. I uh, wonder if you wanted to add a, a few thoughts. Sure. Thank you, Bismar and Jay. Uh, appreciate uh, you giving me the mic. And uh, hey, Dr. M, we keep running into each other. Um, also, Const, I just had a, a point to make uh, just when I'm finished my first point. But uh, while my primary is in computer science and postgrad is in AI, I'm not on the programming end of AI as such, more on the uh, ethics societal change bias and the importance of the democratization of the ai development in our society um especially its removal or should i say at least its um uh, ability to 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 extend beyond the reaches of the incumbents right now in web 2 uh, such as google and facebook and everybody else who contains the the data set training <clears throat> by the people from the people that are using our platform so i think bit bit tensor is revolutionary um you know it, it is as dr m says allows people to participate and um you know i'm, I'm a huge fan and um, super bullish on the whole idea i think it is the only way uh, to maintain a democratized ai environment uh, and to to create use cases that uh, are in uh, the best interests of the uh, majority and not the minority so yeah uh, kudos uh, it's the way to go i think we have a problem in 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 uh, blockchain right now where the call for regulation is a result of celsius three arrows capital do Quan, SBF and Alameda has people calling for regulation, which runs the risk of bringing the same old people from the uh, Web 2 IRL regulation into Web 3 and just imposing the same old rules 
and vested interests upon us. So from, a, from an ethical uh, bias, social inclus inclusion uh, perspective, uh, I'm a 100% supporter of uh, this model of uh, AI training and, and contribution and democratization of AI. And I just want to say uh, max respect to uh, everybody and anybody, but including, most including Const and the team uh, for, for working out these initiatives. They're the future uh, their, their future of making a positive AI environment for us all. Uh, uh, thanks for, for listening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for those those thoughts there. You know, I, and something that you brought up there was, uh, you know, having it in the hands of many and something that can be, uh, something you alluded to was it being unstoppable, right? And when you talk about the power of Bitcoin compute, right, you speak, a, you know, an entire country shut down uh, mining in China, right? But Bitcoin mm -hmm. just kept on chucking. And, you know, if you think yeah. about that from a bit tensor perspective in an, open, you know, an AI model, uh, it sounds like that is kind of what you're reaching for. Yes. Now, it, uh, I think it's GPS, um, you know, brought up a really, really interesting point in, in the last point he, he, he made there um, around regulation and how it's very likely the hammer is coming down in this space. You know, we focused a lot with BitTensor on uh, markets, you know, stitching together resources, building open systems. I, I think that's, you know, all important. But it, at the end of the day, you know, blockchains actually exist to create censorship, uh, censorship resistant technologies as well, right? And if we don't um, make sure that BitTensor lifts off, so to speak, into, uh, um, the internet right into a decentralized system where regulators really can't fuck with us uh we're fucked you know we we worked really hard um at the beginning of this project to make sure that uh like ownership uh was was decentralized and and that's our goal really we need to have that um, ingrained into the technology and GPS wants to say something. So I'm really curious what he would like to, to how he would respond to that. Yeah, go ahead, GP. Uh, oh, th thank you. Um, sorry, it's, it does, there's a few hot mics. So that, yeah, that was Const speaking right there, was it? Yeah. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Okay, bro. Uh, yeah. 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 I worry about that because uh, as you rightly say, an entire nation of uh, approximately one fifth of the world's population uh, whose who's use of the existing uh, AI in the context of social media has introduced a social index in their country, which is oppressive. Therefore, their use of AI is more than likely going to follow the same trajectory as, uh, you know, ban Bitcoin and Bitcoin carried on regardless, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> because Bitcoin is the true uh, blockchain. I guess the risk about uh, deploying AI models uh, or attempting to democratize AI models on blockchains, it's super important to pick blockchains that can be, uh, to use the technical term, have the lowest chance of being fucked with uh, yeah. by external parties. Um, there are uh, too many blockchains that fall into the category of Bino, and uh, I think it's highly ironic that, in fact, the uh, hammer of regulation is coming down on us because of the actions of the existing establishment in centralized exchanges, which are diametrically opposed to the concept of blockchain and the actions of Ginsler and vested interests in the SEC and the Fed. So, um, you know, some people could, uh, you know, throw on a tinfoil hat and suggest that that might have been a three card trick uh, yeah. to try and attempt to get regulation in the space. So the choice of, of platform uh, or blockchain or multiple blockchains or the obfuscation of those um, <clears throat> uh, blockchains when using it or using them as a platform for democratization of AI and uh, model training, building data sets and mining and so forth is super important because otherwise uh, you're just uh, putting a big crosshairs on your back and someone's going to take that pot shot someday and shut you down. Yeah, exactly. And, and we, you know, we built in Polkadot because we really liked the security model of Polkadot and, we like that we can also build any type of 
um, block transition function. And right now, we've been focusing on the machine learning aspect of things, but you know, one of the big pushes in the coming years will be to make sure that the actual chain is is highly decentralized, and we'll have to figure out a way of incentivizing that. Because yes, it needs to, you know, God forbid, if if Ala or myself or anybody else on the team or the foundation comes under legal pressure or physical threats. Um, that this that the technology doesn't die, and that's that's you know very likely in this space, and we you know we're we're aware of that. So, yeah, uh, great point, GPS. Yeah, and that leads in perfectly to uh, you've already kind of said why Polkadot. Um, you know, I being someone who's been in Polkadot Kusama for a while now, you know, you, we've seen a lot of pair chains come in, um, have uh, you know a specific model where. You know, you crowd loan to them, they drop you tokens. Um, you know, there's collators that uh, offer their own tokens and so on and so forth. And I, I, you know, after reading a little bit, BitTensor isn't really that. And so I wonder, you know, how, um, you know, BitTensor sees themselves becoming a pair chain and what that process will look like. Well, we, we are going to... Um win a slot hopefully in in early january and and we'll be launching january 10th on that whether or not we we get the slot we'll have the new chain um done by january 10th and so the the system will will be ready for people to use um we're moving we're moving networks the the incentivization of of the block um in what we can do, I think the real, really simple approach is just to distribute a, a portion of the inflation um, to block producers, and whether or not that's that's five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent, I'm not really sure. That really depends on how how desperately we need the the mining network um, to secure the decentralization of the chain, uh, or how much we need uh, inflation to go into the the mining network on the machine learning side. We can also fork BitTensor into use other different technologies if if it really looks like. And I don't think this will happen, but it is very possible because BitTensor right now, as a technology, is is it doesn't require its layer one. Like it, we we are agnostic to to Polkadot, but I, I'm a firm believer in in Polkadot. I actually really love the technology. I know that it's been, you know, Gavin's been working on it for a really long time, and and I and I really uh, respect him as. The, the team and the technology I've used now for a while, written in Substrate, for instance. Um, and I just know that this is real technology. Um, there's a lot of FUD in and around Polkadot right now, uh, but I'm not really, I'm not, um, you know, uh, down on the technology whatsoever. So, I, you know, I'm not going to be moved by FUD. I, I think really what, what will change um, over the coming months and years is that people really discover that, that this technology is legit and, and they'll, come, they'll come work with us. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions. I'm just looking at them and wondering what people have to say. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight there that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you guys have been speaking about in terms of, you know, hands of the few versus hands of the people, decentralization first, like, uh, you know, everything you're saying there really does seem to share the ideologies of Polkadot, right? And yeah, oh, no, um, it's I'm like right. a match made in heaven sort of thing. And I might say it's like uh, people that have been in the space for a really long time, I my bias is that they care about resistance more um than people that have built projects like later in the game because they're like oh why do we even need you know proof of work and i'm like do you even know what this whole space is um you know like it's it can be frustrating um and and i think that it's because we haven't even yet had the regulatory attacks that we're gonna see that they're gonna come you know and and the people uh, about the core technology of blockchain and it's and it's raison d'etre like we're gonna get hit really hard so i just wanted to mention that and i think gavin is one of those people gavin is definitely someone that's been around here for a really long time and understands the, the technology absolutely all right well we'll move over to uh, i think alpha's had his hand up the longest maybe and then gp and megan after that hey man yeah thanks uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak um glad to have you guys here i am learning a lot and uh I, I appreciate you guys talking about all this stuff because this is really, really impactful. Um, <clears throat> like many of us, I think I, I tend to look towards the future of what are the oncoming 
like narratives and stories that polka dot is going to be a part of um three of those kind of bring to mind like come come to mind that you guys were talking about i think is very important which is the importance of governance right for the betterment of the ecosystem and for the people um security um, for what you guys were talking about specifically here, not only relating to polka dot, but what you guys were talking about with um, the tensor. And so like all of this, and I would say anonymity or like the ability to not be, to be decentralized, right? To, to keep your, your self sovereignty. Um, I think polka dot's a big proponent of that. It's one of the biggest things that I look for in, in an ecosystem. And one thing that I see that you were talking about um, you were talking about like, you made the reference to the example of the internet, right? Um, and that, that is, this is something I, I personally struggle with. Um, we know in the marketing world, a lot of AI tools are already being used. I use some of them. Um, and so one of the things that I see as a problem is that AI tools are only getting better because they're competing against each other. And so we know right now that the internet, a fully open decentralized internet, right, is not necessarily a good or a safe thing. Um, this is the reason why we keep a cap, like tabs on like websites that teach you how to make bombs, et cetera. Um, a concern that I see in the future, because I'm seeing some of it already being used, is m taking modeling from one existing AI that is open sourced and using it in a centralized AI to train it and to make it better so that it becomes better than the decentralized AI. Now, the the problem with governance is that it tends to be slow. And so one of the things that I was thinking about for BitTensor was like, I've always had the idea, and I'm glad you guys are bringing this, it's magnificent, which is like the AI to keep on track has to be better than the next AI. Um, but to be the safest, it has to be decentralized control. Like one entity can I have that control. I'm really afraid of what Google's doing because as a marketer, I know that Google controls like 95% of all data. Um, and it's like they control everything. And thus having that under one person is incredibly dangerous. But how do you, how do you, what, how, like, how do you think about that? Then I have a follow-up question afterwards. Right. Yeah. That's a really good question. So like, um, I'm not opposed to regulation um, and I'm actually not even opposed to censorship as long as there's competition from companies to their own applications, which are more or less regulated or censored than, than others in the space. Um, if, to get a good example would be something like Twitter. It, it should be possible in my opinion that you can just fork all of the data on Twitter in, in, and then, then I can use Twitter that's not censored or Twitter that is. Um, and in my government can regulate certain Twitters and, and, and it's up to their prerogative, um, you know, in that democratic system. If there's no competition, there's, there's a very high chance of concentration of power and corruption um, rather than and there's nothing pulling it away from centralized abuse of power. So that I, I, and I think that's that middle ground where you you you're not opposed to like for instance we released the the a playground uh, that was trained on top of BitTensor and we built regulation into that tool we had a hate speech uh, filter anybody could also have built that tool and not applied the hate speech 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 filter and that's that's what makes it an open system. Um, if people, it's people's choice to, to use the technology how they want. Now, and the, thing, the other thing you said was um, uh, people taking AIs which are decentralized and turning them into centralized AIs which are, which are better, right? That's well, actually the, the – oh, sorry. It was, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, and, and the reason is because I'm seeing it where the centralized AI can train faster because it has no limitations based on – governance or being open source or, or whatever the case may be like they feed it exactly what it needs to be fed yeah that's a little bit like what i was talking about at the beginning of the call where they fine tune it uh they fine tune the ai to something that that is more specific to their use case uh, we built BitTensor to do that innately like that is the core technology it's like let's let's general knowledge base that then the clients to the system can fine tune it to whatever they want in the same way that you can use the fork of Twitter to make your own 
Twitter and fine tune it to a particular in a particular way. So it, it, the the concept of sort of stealing is is uh, innate to to the technology we're built building. Mm-hmm. Like it's inherent. It's inherent. Great. And so that that leads perfectly to my other question, which is if if this is innate in in the blockchain in in the open AI they, or like the AI in that the you network. guys are doing in the network. Yeah. yeah. Um, how does blockchain anonymity, which is such a big part of blockchain, play yeah. a role into this? How do you add, would you, I'm, I'm guessing you would need to have some kind of DID solution to be implemented so that you're able to actually keep tabs on making sure that there's always good faith actors. Well, I, I don't, I don't think we, um, need those things. Uh, I think we already have bad faith actors in in BitTensor, and the system needs to be robust to to bad faith actors, or it can't be an open source and decentralized technology that runs like or or and open boundary. Right? Um, there are people in our community, and you know, it's one of the things that we talked about at the beginning of the call. Like, it, it's a double edged sword. Um, there are people constantly trying to break us. And and that's that's actually like a, it, it, you 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 can't you'd throw the baby out with the bathwater if you tried to remove all of them uh, from your system because they're actually the most innovative. That mentality is actually incredibly innovative, and we're leveraging it to to make the system better. So making the system better, what do you see the challenges that brings to the populace? And what do you mean by the populace? Like the I would yeah, like people using this. For example, being able to use a modeling, yeah, um, to do something that is a bad bad faith like act, right. whether it was to break ATMs. Yeah, or... it's. I mean, it's it's nonstop. I mean, there's so many different corner cases that that come up, and that we're constantly um, patting down and learning. Like, I mean, example today, like. Um, we we had a, a mechanism for for validators to maintain stay in the network, which was that they'd have ten twenty four staked on their system. So what did intelligent gamified people do? Is they were like, oh great, well I'll just get a whole bunch of ten twenty four tau, and and fill the network with my with my miners that can never get deregistered. They'll never be able to get kicked out. So I'm, I'm sure most of that is just jargon to the people in this in this call. That turned out to be a bad mechanism. We discovered that this was an approach that people were applying. Mm-hmm. We now have to change that, right? So right. that that's it's a continu- It's really a continuous, and the, we the, that's one of the many challenges that we're we're solving. You know, it's like really really interesting. In my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is this is one of the things that I tend to quarrel over, which is like, a hey, if you're not in t- continuously innovating or pushing it. Yeah, you continuously patching, so it's like one. Yeah. It's like you're just fighting it. And so, I guess, yeah. man, one more question. Yeah. Um, which is, if you see this, what is the like the biggest danger that you would actually say? Like, okay, I know all of the benefits. I see all of the greatest things here. Yeah. yeah. What is something that actually I'm like worried about, or could possibly happen? That's a great question. I feel like I'm in a, a, an interview. Um, oh, sorry. So, yeah, no, 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 no. You know, like for a job position, what, you know, what are your biggest flaws? Um, it, it, that's a really good one. I mean, like the we we don't know what would happen if there was, a, for instance, a large group of extremely well funded uh, people that were committed to breaking the system. Uh, inside of our community i think that's always the risk right Mm -hmm. the formation of of cabals the formation of of groups of people that are coordinated and malicious because especially in decentralized distributed hard to know who's who and and that's part of the anonymity um Mm -hmm. and and also to so you you how do you how do you detect them like how do you know what they're doing and and I think like as we're pretty small there's definitely actors that could take us out it's like it's like in the early days of Bitcoin like it wasn't censorship resistant against the government until like maybe this year right, it, right. the United States government could just bought all the ASIC miners in you know 2012 and then it would have died right that would have been a large 
a large scale coordinated actor. And I think that there's a certain level of scale and maturity in the technology that we need before we will be fully resistant. And we're, you know, we're aware of that. And that's kind of like, that's the thing that keeps me up all night is, okay, what's mm-hmm. that, what, what's that thing look like? What could they be doing um, and to, to manipulate the incentive or hack the system? And, and you know, we have to be aware and, and there's unknown for us. That's a really good question. Well, I'm glad you guys are here in Polkadot because I think what Polkadot offers with governance too and the decentralization and the security, I think you guys are going uh, to, I mean, I'm, it's, I'm ecstatic to, to have you guys here and be part of the eco. Do you guys have a lot to offer? Thanks, Alpha. Alpha, really that question that you had last, I thought you were asking if iRobot is a possibility. Honestly, that's what I was <laughs> I was wondering. But uh, GP, my friend, how are you? Um, you got something for us? Uh, you know, I'm going to uh, defer to Megan the Token Blonde because I've asked a couple and she had her hand up. So if that's okay, yeah, if Megan still wants to speak, I'll defer and wait till she's finished. Absolutely. Oh, thank you very much. Um yeah, actually, I just had um, a few technical questions, if that's all right, because um, um, some people here in the audience um, know that I'm a fan of proof of work, and um, I'm always asking about um, solutions in the substrate ecosystem that are using that. And I'm just wondering, um, and, and I do apologize if I if I missed um, your explanation of how proof of work factors into your solution earlier. Um, but uh, honestly, a lot of that stuff just went right over my head because I'm not like a computer scientist or anything. But um, yeah, I was just curious. Um, and you mentioned that um, your solution doesn't uh, rely on a layer one right now. Is that right? No, it is. It is a layer one. I mean, so we have our own chain, uh, if that's what you mean. And so we okay, have our cool. own block, block transition function, which is currently a, a POA. So it's a proof of authority. There's no, there's no proof of work involved, and there's neither is there proof of stake. It's really just um, a set of validators with their own keys that that get to sign blocks, and that's like so, 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 so um, a fully decentralized proof of work block transition. It's and on top of that chain is where we run the the bit tensor incentive mechanism, which has its own consensus. So like think of it like a single smart contract that runs on, or a pallet, if you know, polka dot uh, that runs on top of a blockchain. And that's what, that's where the bit tensor uh, incentive mechanism runs. And that's where we focused most of our research and development, because that's what makes us unique. Now we can always, this polka dot's a great portable, um, you know, ecosystem of technologies. We can plug and play POS or, and POW at a later date for the block transition. So right now, the 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 way in which we distribute tokens is fully with inside that pallet, which which is a POI, you might say, or it's like Yuma consensus. It's all our form of consensus. Okay, very interesting. Thanks for explaining that. GP, did you have something? Uh, yeah, bro. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, we have precedent for uh, the establishment um, making moves on new uh, democratized or privatized um, methods for the populace to communicate uh, in the form of uh, secure email, secure comms, the encryption debates, uh, and the dark web. Um, I mean, the way they started uh, their attack on that was with Warren Canary's not sec letters and red notices. Uh, they, you know, they infiltrate, observe, profile, plan, and then execute in order to dismantle. And we have precedent for that in Hansa Web and Alpha Bay uh, or um, uh, dark web markets. Um, I think the the thing about bad actors in an open source environment is that in the in the existing infrastructure, uh, you in you know m- my experience working in, for intelligence services and working for anti corruption initiatives, um, the the space is full of uh, honeypots right now. Uh, they're observing. 
they're looking at uh, weaknesses in the system. Regulation is not here because they're slow. It's not here because they're just wait. They're, they're looking at the actions of people in order to determine what the possibilities are. And I think it's very much demonstrable by uh, the Pegasus software group, uh, software provider in Israel and their warehouse of zero days ex and exploits, which they provide to undermine secure comms globally uh, to governments. Uh, I think similarly with blockchains, uh, they're finding or looking for the loopholes, and and they will act upon them. I think I think uh, finally the patent farming, the buyout offers the. The attraction of money will will allow people like Google to retain ownership of these initiatives, um, and and ultimately money is what appeals to a lot of people, and buyouts appeal to a lot of people. So the obfuscation for for corrupt behaviours in some of the uh, case management or developed intelligence systems we we uh, we built, uh, which were built on blockchain, were specifically. Uh, catering around identifying bad actors um, and preventing them from deletion, obfuscation, alteration, manipulation, <clears throat> false augmentation, exfiltration, and willful negligence. And I, you have to build those countermeasures into your architecture uh, if you want to be robust. But if the founder is doxxed, and Alpha AI did mention about uh, blockchain anonymity, the unfortunate truth is that while uh, when you get on blockchain and you have an address, you are anonymous, but your entry point to blockchain, uh, 90 plus percent of the entry point to blockchain to actually transact is through a KYC AML exchange uh, in a CEX. So it's quite not as anonymous as it, as it, as it is made out to be. Um, so yeah, the, the, the open source and, and the detection of corrupt behaviors, the, the, um, the ability to maintain independence from either regulatory pressure, money pressure from buyouts, or legislative pressure, uh, you know, is it has precedent in the areas of secure comms, encryption, dark web, and secure emails. And you know, there there, there has been people who have been the, the subject of Warren Canaries and NatSec letters who have had to let their systems be infiltrated while the organizations gathered intelligence on the communications. And if the individuals uh, who develop these um, new uh, methods <clears throat> are, are going to be doxxed, they are the weak or the weak link in the chain because the pressure brought to bear on them uh, to give the keys to the kingdom is the weak point in the system. Uh, so yeah, it's based on experience and, and, and uh, I hope that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> Titus, you had your hand up, my friend. Did you have something to add? Yeah, buddy. Uh, I Wow. 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 I mean, that is scary shit. Um, I, I've been a victim of that. Um, but I... I, I, you know, I don't do cryptocurrency or nothing like that or investments. I, uh, I work for the children, man. I work for the babies in this world. And, um, uh, it seems after I basically gave my life to them and put my head on the chopping block and, and snitched on some folks, uh, they came after me, man. And when I say they came after me, the government came after me in, in creepy ways, like uh, on Facebook and, and Twitter and things like that. And I, I, I pissed some folks off so bad. I'm literally, I've literally been placed in the algorithm. And it, and it seems, I might be wrong, but it seems like we all are programming the AI. You know what I mean? To, to understand the, like the destructive nature of, what this world is you know if if truth and love prevails it's gonna mess the algorithm up because the algorithm was created on evil and lies and murder rape and pillage like i mean in in life in general and in on the stock market ouch, I, ouch. yeah Oof. <laughs> what a great wow. sound effect there you go but yeah i mean i think what uh gp brought up you know and what you're touching on a little bit titus is 
you know, you can't necessarily take away those bad actors. And what Kant has also um, reiterated a lot as well is that part of the decentralized model is you got to take um, some of those uh, tough things and be able to learn from them, adapt and uh, make your product more robust. And yes. it sounds like, yeah. you know, with the decentralized system, at, you know, that is exponential in terms of the number of nodes you have, the more people that are contributing to that system, the stronger and maybe the stronger the system is overall and maybe the quieter those bad actors become. It, you know, the, the, the technology inherent to machine learning is imitation. And so in many ways, the people that we use to train it um, will be reflected in the technology itself, right? So um, the people that, and then Absolutely. the question is who gets to choose, right? Who chooses the data? And, and that's kind of where we start our, you know, our, our, our journey with BitTensor, right? So. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and that's something I, uh, you know, I think a lot of the people in the Polkadot ecosystem may echo in terms of the, uh, you know, the tech reflecting the people that are within it too. I, I think we see that a little bit, right? Like Polkadot's focus is interoperability, and a lot of these teams in this space really work together, and it's almost like the tech and the people have find found themselves in a way. I don't know. That's seems I don't know if that makes sense, but something I've seen to notice a little bit there um, that you know the product attracts a certain type of person and certain type, certain groups. Um, but GP, uh, you have your hand up. Yeah. Thanks man. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, that's a core area of my interest, which is the bias of the, of the training data set being reflected through the bias of the people who are providing the data for the training data set. And it's one of the real weak links for either poor or negative outcomes or, or false positives. Like Dr. M has heard me mention this before. And, you know, your the quality of your output is only as good as the quality of your input. Um, I think the, um, the point that Titus made in terms of, uh, you, you know, uh, bad actors in the system and, and the, uh, the personality of the uh, individuals or organizations who create these systems is very much like the relationship or the personality that a dog has based on the first six months of its life uh, and uh, reflecting its owner's behavior. AI is very like that in terms of it takes on the personality of the people training it. Um, you know, the training data sets uh, that Google have is basically the entire world population who use it. Uh, same with Facebook and all the facial recognition and the NLP programming and, you know, the, 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 the um, annotation of our images has basically been free consulting that we all willfully or willingly provide to them to annotate the pictures to help train their, their AI. Those type of resources uh, in the context of uh, what is a very small ecosystem now in Web3 are not as available. So one wonders about how swiftly the AI and the, and so forth can evolve within the blockchain considering the uh, number of users of the blockchain right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I agree with Titus. I think it, it uh, the invention reflects the personality of the inventor. Um, and we've got to be very careful about the quality of training data that we provide but yeah you know that's uh, i have other things to say about that but i, I just don't want to go on monologues but uh, yeah, please you know. be careful please be careful mm -hmm. alpha do you have something to add there yeah yeah I'm, i mean i think that's why i was talking to about you know you want to keep it open source but i do think that like gov2 or even something like what follow network is doing with you know, the inter the tracking using soulbound tokens or NFTs to track an identity without without losing your anonymity. For example, it's like walking down the street in New York City. People know you're there. They walk into you. They might even bump into you, but they don't know anything about you. Right. They, they know how you look and that's it. So there's a certain level of anonymity we just accept as a populace. Right. The same thing can happen in blockchain. And so I do think. You were talking about 90% of anonymity is kind of lost because you have to go through some kind of KYC process, right? That's correct. This is why they want to ban mining or any kind of like, this is why the, I, I really do believe that bit, things like Bitcoin or gen, or like just general mining, the ability to generate some form of transactable value outside of the system is super dangerous because it keeps your anonymity. If there's, 
if you have a just a random address who, that has a miner that is generating um, Bitcoin and Ethereum that is transactable and now has value, that is dangerous because they don't really know who's doing it or, you know, how they're doing it, who that person is. And then you can take those Ethereums and, you know, use them wherever you want. So that keeps your anonymity. I, I do feel like we're mo- we were moving in that direction, which was one of the bullish, like most bullish things for crypto in my um, aspect. But we get into this danger now where it's like because of all the tools and amazing ability that that crypto and blockchain bring to the table, um, you need to have some form of DID to at least have some kind of on chain identity without ever giving away your real identity on. And I think that's something that BitTensor could, you know, if apply in a way through regulation. You said you were pro-regulation and obviously keeping things. Well, I think that would be like a really interesting discussion to have. Um, I, I'm, I'm, to- I'm okay with the endpoints regulating themselves and choosing the regulation that they want. Um, I want to keep regulation out of the base layer as much as possible. That's, I should be free. Um, yeah, and so you're using and, decentralized governance for that, right? Yes. And, you know, we haven't really figured out how we can do that. So you've raised a lot of, a lot of interesting points, and we could, we could definitely use a DID um, system. And there's a lot of really interesting ideas in that space. It's very difficult, you know, to, to get um, soulbound tokens onto, onto a chain. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a way, it's like um, it really defeats the of of crypto, you know, in, 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 in some sense when people become super KYC and I really think that, you know, as much as possible, we should, we should fight for, we should figure out ways of doing it without needing, um, identities on the chain. Uh, it may be a requirement though. And, and, you know, like it may just be that the, the regulators come and, and really, really pressure us super early to make it impossible to do things like governance without, uh, doxing our, our, you know, our community have to fight that battle i think um pretty soon yeah i mean like i said it, it all comes down to if you're never having to part if you're never ever having to generate anything in the system you never have to use a sex because you don't use dollars because you mined all of your coins that you become a very anonymous person mm-hmm. yeah mm. and and i think that that's great I, I i really want to promote that as much as as possible it's freedom uh for the people that 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 work with us mm. Yeah, I agree there. Uh, GP, you want to add that? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, doesn't that uh, uh, alpha AI uh, depend on the device you're using, though? Because of the complication of anonymity, uh, your your entry point to crypto, okay, may not be KYC AML, but you're on a digital device, uh, which is which is profiled, which is trackable. You know, there are multiple layers of of breadcrumbs and digital footprints you're leaving before you get to the point where you can, uh, you know, become an anonymous user of crypto or blockchain. Yeah, that's why they had to take uh, Tornado Cash out, and that's why the founder of that guy is in jail, but SBF isn't. You know, that's what's really worrying. It's the fact that, you know, everyone wants to talk about Tornado Cash was bad for some reasons, right? But there's a reason why that guy's in jail and, and SBF or people like SBF aren't. It's because the, the the less anonymity you have, the least the least powerful you are. So, I mean, all of it plays yeah. in. There's there's strength there. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, they got their jail sentence extended by a further three months until they sold his Corolla or something to to pay for his defense. Uh, what as we as you say, SBF is given interviews with the New York Times. So that plays exactly to the narrative that we're all aware of here, which is if you're the small guy with the innovative idea uh, who's got something that's a threat to national security, you're immediately going to be put behind bars. But uh, when you're SPF playing with the big boys, uh, actually playing a three-card trick to probably accelerate regulation, uh, you're given... uh, uh, pull your again puff pieces from the New York Times and have the absolute cheek to be still tweeting that you're trying to learn what happened. Uh, I mean, how how stupid, uh, or sorry, that reflects <laughs> how stupid these people think we are. Um, 
Uh, luckily, that's not the truth. Uh, Comstan and Alpha AI and Titus. So over the last four years, as a result of, of our work uh, in other areas, um, we put together a four-part solution, which we, uh, I don't want to name, mention the name of my project, if that's against the rules of the floor. Uh, that's all right. Go ahead, man. Yeah, so at the answer, um, we we have combined digital identity with uh, what we call uh, TAMI, the answer access method, which is based off two patents I hold in a blockchain data processing protocol and virtual blockchain as, uh, access method. Uh, that gives a very high degree of anonymity and also gets rid of federated and centralized control which are typically two of the major reasons why we don't have anonymity or control over our data in Web2. It also then, uh, Titus and Alpha AI, allows the, uh, the person with the digital identity to, to, to proxy their identity or the elements of their identity that they wish for whatever service that they're choosing to subscribe to. Also takes away the walled gardens and gated silos and therefore the, um, by extension, the power that they hold uh, by uh, retaining all the metrics and analytics under the digital identity and, and or the, you know, which can be represented as an NFT. Uh, then sitting on some long side of that, uh, within the digital identity and the access method, the user themselves is employing big data analytics and AI tools, AI tools in particular to uh, scan physical objects uh, to, to take their unstructured data and make it structured data and use analytics to to perform uh, operations against that data which they can then sell as opposed to give to for free to organizations so as opposed to you being profiled you profile yourself and then can sell the, uh, the specific elements or monetize the specific elements of your own behaviors to organizations who have value or put value upon that uh, this is uh, manifested in the uh, real world by dApps, dApps which you can sign on to, um, you know, using uh, centralized and, and federated logins, if you wish to, or with DIDs. And what it says, uh, uh, the timeline is to uh, migrate, or the objective is, is to migrate these tyrannical uh, Web 2 processes uh, to Web 3 over a period of time to result in, you know, the achievement of what we're always talking about, which is mass adoption, but without having to do the mass education at the same time. It undermines federated identity, walled gardens, surveillance capitalism, the erosion of civil liberties, uh, surveillance capitalism, mass surveillance, abuse of power, privacy breaches, uh, unauthorized monetization and, and gated silos. And finally and foremost, um, underneath all of that, it supports the liquidity within the coins infrastructure, crypto infrastructure, by not allowing it to be only subject to rampant speculation, but also to uh, have the, the, the coins be used for the exchange of product and services by people in the real world who know nothing about the underlying technology. In other words, abstract totally the technology of Web3 from the use cases at the front end. Um, and with that, uh, elements of that can certainly be pals of the attempt to, uh, to keep the uh, AI uh, on the blockchain experiment uh, away from the prying eyes of those who would seek to undermine it. Man, I have a friend named Bruno. I think you guys would get along. He also hates the United States. <laughs> There's always a wager, gentlemen. There's always a wager between good and evil. So they, those both people have to fight their own fight, the good fight, the bad fight. Um, and, you know, like I said before, in, in what I told you about what I'm into, um, in faith in God, I'm not sure if everybody believes and it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, it, it does, but not to, you know, I'm, I'm not in control of that, of course. But uh, in faith, you know what I mean? I did. I do what I do in faith of the algorithm, you know, in faith of the good, not the evil, the good, not the bad. So the the anonymity of uh, of yourself can also be dangerous because whenever you're behind a block wall, how are you going to know, you, you know what I mean, who to who to look for when you're scared and running? 
Well, just to just to, to clarify something, I don't I I don't know who said it, but I I don't hate the United States. I hope that didn't come across in in my uh, no. It's world. a joke. It's a joke because Bruno talks about it a lot, but he's a decentralized Maxi as well, and we just we we just joke that way because everything you named off is very like American. Like there's a lot of corporatism, right? So it's just it's a joke. Don't I didn't mean any offense. Oh no no I'm not offended I just didn't want I just I didn't want you to be offended so yeah no no man uh, I have a thick skin bro I don't get offended that easily I just wanted to make sure it it's not a political statement anything I've said all it is is an attempt well not an attempt it's been a, a, lot, a lot of years of work and a lot of money that we've bootstrapped ourselves to try you know I've been around a while okay you know I I I was. Uh, you know, I saw the semiconductor when I was a kid on, on the science shows and the doom and gloom that people said would follow its adoption. I worked in the early internet in New York City and Tribeca. Uh, you know, I was part of the startups that, you know, uh, like the street.com vignette, ATG Dynamo, Old Couture, um, you know, um, pop.com, if you remember those guys, uh, lastminute.com in London. Uh, you know, I went through the, the, uh, the sort of winter of, of uh, uh, you know, 2002 to 2008. Uh, I then became an alphabet agency contrarian and, a, and an advocate for civil liberties, privacy, and the maintenance of, uh, of our democratic rights when, when social media started to be adopted. And it was clear that Zuckerberg and others were, didn't have our best interests at heart, uh, keenly interested in the, in the um, non-undermining uh, of encryption. Um, and wrote for Peerlist uh, until they were closed down. You know, a million um, infosec professionals globally writing about their stories, and 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 I think these subjects are are simply moving, or these challenges are simply moving from that domain into this domain, and and it's incredibly important while we're all excited about the technology that we understand the realities of uh, of the way the world works. Somebody spoke about the good feeling the bad. Uh, or the, the fight against good and evil. I mean, the white wolf and the black wolf. It's a it's a famous uh, you know um, Mesoamerican American Indian um, <clears throat> Native American, I should say, uh, saying you've got to feed each equally in order to maintain balance. But you know, the, the fight between good and evil is one thing. The fight between those who seek to oppress and those who seek to maintain freedom uh, is you've only got to feed one part of that debate which is the people who fight to, to maintain freedom uh, and, and resist oppression. And, and I, you know, I think it's naive and, you know, for people to think that uh, this is not going to be interrupted uh, and, uh, and, and innovation is not going to be stifled by pressures that are going to come from the establishment. I mean, man, they start wars, you know, for energy that last decades, you know, if they think their financial system is going to be undermined, you know, just imagine what they're willing to do just to stop that happening. Well, GP, it's really good having you up here today, and you're welcome back anytime. I want to throw it to our buddy, Credit Card Scissors. What's going on, bud? Yes, sir. Appreciate it, Jerry. Uh, GP, I I was pretty struck by your analogy earlier of, of the the dog and the owner, if you will. Um, and this is kind of one of my bigger concerns on a – kind of political and philosophical level um, and the application of AI is the kind of removal of the, the kind of perceived removal of the human hand, if you will. And for a lot of people, I, and I don't know if I can necessarily claim uh, ex expertise in this area, but trying to gain understanding, trying to gain my you know, awareness of very quickly uh, changing the world from a technological level. But many people are just users. Uh, most people just want to, uh, you know, apply the technology. And I guess I, I have a lot of concern for the, when this perceived removal of human hand uh, philosophically um, comes, like, and people don't realize just how much of the spirit of the dog, if you will, is is actually, you know, encapsulated from the spirit of the owner. Um, those data sets that you were talking about um, for inputs, like, is is the only way to, is the only way to, uh, uh, I guess safeguard that to head toward Web three and blockchain is is that kind of what I'm hearing? Is it is particularly with this technology? Um, I guess me just trying to kind of piece through this from from a layman's perspective. But does that make sense? 
Uh, yeah, sure, credit card. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it breaks down into different areas of training data sets. I think maybe just to refine the analogy a little bit, um, I mean, bias is introduced into training data sets by people who select the training data who have conscious or unconscious bias in certain areas, which has resulted in very bad outcomes for things like uh, AI run uh, access to social programs in, in, in North America where uh, the AI um, uh, has been programmed in, or trained incorrectly and has uh, stopped people from receiving social assistance or social housing or other assistance. And because of the lack of explainable AI or the lack of research and into explainable AI, the AI is a black box. So when somebody goes to seek why it is that they've been turned down when they're entitled to an entitlement, uh, their query can't be answered. So uh, because basically the person can't say why the black box has made the decision. So that's one poor element of training data sets, which is it is not accompanied by uh, algorithms uh, uh, of XAI where you can explain why the AI has made the decision that it has. Uh, the second area is willful uh, um, uh, uh, input of bias training data. Uh, I don't want to get into a number of examples of that right now because some of them are quite offensive. Um, um, but uh, the data fed into a system can result in uh, genders or ethnicities being removed from a particular uh, progression path of a selection method, for example. Uh, the third, and uh, there are others, but the third and final is the false positive training data. And a, a good way of of uh, using XAI or certain elements of XAI is to, is to use heat maps to ask the AI, uh, how did you make this decision? And there's a good example of it uh, in the context of uh, a project that was used to identify, and Dr. Will have heard me spoke about this before, uh, pictures of wolves in the wild versus dogs. Uh, and the training data was fed into the system and the AI had an almost 100% accurate uh, um, um, choice of wolf, uh, you know, versus dog. So as far as they were concerned, they had a successfully uh, trained AI algorithm, which could, you know, to nearly 100% degree of accuracy, identify a wolf in an image. However, when you apply heat maps to that, it turned out that the reason it was identifying it as a wolf was that all the training data that they provided for wolves had snow in the background. And using reinforcement learning, it wasn't recognizing the wolf. It was just basically saying that this particular type of animal in the training data set is, is basically surrounded by snow. So the AI people thought is identifying wolves, whereas the heat map shows it's making its decision based on the presence or absence of snow. So that's how training data sets can, can, can bias uh, decision-making in various different scenarios and why it's important to make sure that XAI travels alongside AI training data sets. That's totally wild. Hey, uh, Nava, nice to see you, man. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, what's going on in your mind? Hey, man. Good to see you guys. Great to be back on stage, man. I've been traveling, work, whatnot, but I've uh, been missing been missing my summer nights, man. Uh, came in and it was a heavy conversation. I just jumped in in the middle, so I don't want to uh, interrupt or, or take us off track, man, but I'm, I'm glad to hear this, man. It, 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 it is something that is, I'm, I'm enlightened by it. So just chilling, man. Sweet. Well, it's great to have you back. Uh, we've actually been off for a couple of weeks, so this is a weird conversation to come back to. Uh, we, actually, <laughs> <This is> heavy. <laughs> we actually had to let Thomas go, um, uh, which is fantastic. But um, maybe uh, I kind of wanted to circle back to the beginning here. Uh, GP, by the way, are you you're part of are, are you validating on the BitTensor network? Uh, not right now. No. So you're just here like kind of you're intrigued by the project? Yes, I'm here doing due diligence, sir. Okay, all right. Well, very nice to have you. Well, I'm wondering, um, maybe Dr. M there, um, because earlier in the conversation, Cons was kind of talking about empowering, like, uh, you know, the, the people who own the network together. Um, you're hearing this conversation, um, 
how how do you take the the responsibility of of building this this network supporting AI and and how do you see you as an individual can play a role in kind of the outcome of all this going forward? Uh, what a great question! Yes, um, you know there is um, uh, actually tremendous autonomy in uh, in the BitTensor network in the sense that. Um, uh, well, the reality, you know, currently is that I'm really just taking some of the, um, uh, you know, well-performing models, um, pre-trained models um, released by other companies and uh, and fine-tuning those to be better and running those on BTensor is, uh, is the current reality. But um, uh, intrinsically, um, you have uh, uh, pretty much autonomy in terms of... Um, uh, what you uh, you can choose, you know, what you can, uh, what you want to um, train uh, or, or basically give BitTensor. Um, you know, it's um, so long as, uh, well, I mean, for the moment, um, at least personally, I have a hard time imagining that anyone would um, would have any ill intentions there in terms of the training of AI, but that's like, you know, definitely something that um, to, you know, to think about or a concern that um, can come up because, you um, uh, you know, BitTensor needs to be the the way that um, that it is in the sense that um, basically each node's model is um, is a uh, black box to everyone else other than the operator of that node. Um, uh, it it kind of needs to be this way because this system drives on um, uh, incentive and on competition among um, the people serving models, basically. And it and it really works too, you know. BitTensor um, uh, has uh, shown um, that what has you know been achieved in a year is um, the pace is just astounding. Um, and I think that if um, some of the larger AI companies um, are probably just not paying attention, but um, you know, should they become aware of it, they'll be like, um, wow, you know, because um, uh, yeah, it's tremendous. So so you know, there is definitely concerns, um, many of which Kant mentioned a- along the way. Um, for me personally, I think that the biggest one is it's just and Kant touched on this. Um, it is that um, uh, you know I'm basically in love with BitTensor. Um, it is a baby, relatively speaking, and it is um, a tiny network, and uh, I care so much for it. But I also know that there is um, you know big um, uh, potentially ill-intentioned uh, forces that can um, align against it, and that's kind of. My biggest worry, but um, you know, I- internally within the BitTensor system, um, there is um, you know what what you're doing as a node is um, uh, basically uh, you know what you're training or or what model you're using or really what you're feeding BitTensor is kind of um, uh, is hidden from everyone else and it needs to be that way. So because it's the competition that um, drives the innovation here and. Uh, really, I mean, in a way, BitTensor is set out to uh, to prove and has done so in, in 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 many metrics and ways already. It is set out to prove that um, this sort of a, um, uh, a way to innovate in machine learning it, it is more efficient than uh, the, the established paradigms of developing ML, which is basically two ways, right? You either have um, industry giants doing it or you have academia. Um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, uh, well, what I hope for is that um, uh, BitTensor will ultimately succeed um, and that these concerns will uh, not materialize to become ultimately a roadblock, um, in which case, um, surely it will be, um, you know, widely known that this is the way to do AI and we're going to see um I suppose the equivalent of like Ethereum and Generation Three uh, smart contracting platforms uh, following what BitTensor has done. Yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. Um, you know, I think that's kind of keys into one of the powers of blockchain, right? Is to give the uh, keen into what GP has mentioned in the past as well. You know, it gives the little guy. Um, a little bit more power, right? Because you have this decentralization, you have this um, blockchain, which is that truth machine uh, in the background driving the incentives. And, you know, if enough people uh, buy into it uh, over time, it becomes censorship resistant, resistant, right? And so, um, you know, Betensor is doing some incredible things. And I did have one more uh, question if uh, maybe one of Dr. M, maybe, or GP, if you guys... Um, may have an opinion on this. Um, you know, 
I think I heard Allah in one of your spaces, Dr. M, which are great. Um, I love listening to those. Uh, mentioned that, you know, the tensor is not to the point yet where they have surpassed open AI, you know, of, of, with this advent of chat GPT, of course, this has been really great, but from an infrastructure standpoint, I guess what would be that point where, you know, they think that they have either maybe not surpassed open AI itself, but are the leaders, uh, in that space? I uh, gosh, that's a great question. And one that, um, you know, I, I, in fact, ask the uh, const at the at the last one of those um, spaces, because um, I was really curious too. I mean, it's clear to me that the um, uh, uh, tensor is not quote unquote competitive yet, um, but I don't want that to be mistaken for what it's done because um, really you're looking at a much faster pace of development than basically can be done any other way. Um, so not to diminish that, and that's extraordinary, and that's why everyone who's involved is uh, so excited about this. Um, uh, but basically, to answer the question, Const said um, in about a year, um, is, is what he said about um, two or three weeks ago when I asked him the same question, that, um, you know, when will be Tensor be competitive? And, and, and you know, with AI, um, it is the nature of AI that basically... Uh, up until, you know, you're, uh, say, the best or near the best, uh, you're going to see basically no use. No one's going to be interested because, um, you know, whatever, if I can use GPT-3, why would I go and use GPT-2? <laughs> now, they are by the same entity, but, you know, you get my point. Um, but then the moment that you're there, um, then all of a sudden you go, you know, you go from no interest to all the interest in the world. So, um, you know, uh, we look forward to that, of course. Um but um, yeah, so so a year would be two years from the beginning of um, of this system, which is um, uh, kind of incredible if you think about how how long it's taken to get to GPT four, let's say. So um, exciting times. Um, I, the worries along the way, of course, um, but I just you know really feel that democratization and decentralization of AI is really a cause worth fighting for and that people should generally want AI decentralized and if they don't you know yell out wanting this is because they're likely just not aware of all the ways that already we are being manipulated in all sorts of ways from centralization of AI. I think that's kind of um, you know my, my summary of the sentiment here. Yeah, um, totally agree, uh, Kusamaria. My my view on when they will uh, overtake if uh, open AI. Well, you know, they're coming up on their second anniversary. Um, we will see a point where a word of mouth and the tipping point occurs, and because of the democratization and the involvement of the little person and the lower barrier or the no barrier to entry, as opposed to the massive barrier to entry to contribute uh, in other domains, I expect uh, that that one to two year estimate that Dr. M was given by Const uh, is is pretty on, on point. Uh, and I think uh, once that happens, I think they'll just speed away into the distance. Uh, that's my take. Outstanding. I really appreciate you guys coming up here. Um, this has been a, a great, great conversation with some in, incredibly enlightening things uh, in the AI space. I think everybody's really been enamored with GPT-3, right? And um, you know, seeing a project like BitTensor come to Polkadot and share a lot of the same values and um, expand on something that's, uh, you know, a part of our future. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's exciting to talk about. So I appreciate you guys coming up and cons, if you catch the end of this, appreciate you too. Um, thank you for coming on. And, you know, we're looking forward to seeing you guys more often. Feel free to come around. Um, and, you know, we'll be having this every week for everyone else. Um, every Thursday uh, around 9.30 Eastern we'll be hosting these spaces talking to different projects and a lot of times we open it up to the to the crowd to kind of talk to General Polkadot but I think this is a good place to end it um, you know this has been such a great conversation I don't know where we really go from here right <laughs> um, so uh, thank you guys and we will see you next week much appreciated have a good day